Okay, great. Um, so it it is exciting times in the management of metastatic breast cancer. I've been treating breast cancer now for almost 20 years, and I can tell you the last five to 10 years, there's been dramatic changes. And, and I think to get a sense of the appreciation of, of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going, um, I will talk a little bit about the history of, of treatment and then really focus on these last, uh, last two decades uh, where I think the most advances have been made. Uh, as you can see, we, uh, we certainly have weapons of mass destruction, and these are the ones that we've actually found. Um, so metastatic breast cancer. Uh, and this is important, I think, to understand the distinction, because I think these terms are used interchangeably, stage four or metastatic. Um, it, it sounds like semantics, but in terms of how we collect data and how we look at statistics and clinical trials, stage four refers to a patient who actually is presenting with metastasis at the time of their diagnosis of breast cancer, which makes up only about 10% of all patients with metastatic breast cancer. Other patients who may have been stage one or stage two are still referred to as stage one or two, now metastatic. Um, and with metastatic breast cancer, the primary treatment is systemic therapy, which again is what a medical oncologist does. Local therapy, such as radiation or sometimes even surgery, is reserved for certain situations depending on symptoms and, and other scenarios. So uh, just to go back a little bit uh, in history, this is one of the earlier recorded cases of metastatic breast cancer. In 1644, the mother of, of King Louis XIV retired to a monastery to cope with symptoms, fatigue and bone pain after she had found a lump in her breast. And despite what was at that time cutting edge therapy of arsenic paste, bloodlettings, herbs and enemas, uh, she did ultimately pass from breast cancer. Now, flash forward to World War I, where, the, uh, where troops in Belgium had reported uh, a cloud around their feet and an unusual bitter smell in the air. Uh, the uh, Germans had used mustard gas against Allied troops at that point, and several thousand troops had died. When autopsies were done on these troops, they found that there was a profound decrease in white blood cells which uh, led to as many advances um, that seemed to happen. Uh, the next World War, World War II, a Nazi air raid on Allied forces in Italy sunk a U.S. battleship, the USS John Harvey, and uh, that ship had actually been carrying mustard gas in anticipation of the Nazis potentially attacking Allied troops again. And again, many soldiers died, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander studied these soldiers and noted this same drop in white count. Uh, incidentally, uh, uh, do uh, Dr. Alexander's boss knew the chairman of uh, General Motors uh, and the, uh, the vice chairman, uh, Charles Sloan and, uh, or Alfred Sloan and Charles Kettering, and uh, asked them to endow an institute uh, which uh, ultimately became known as uh, the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in, uh, in New York. And then a few years later, uh, a pathologist decided to challenge the prevailing, uh, prevailing thought at that time that children with leukemia should be left to die in peace. And he developed a drug which ultimately became known as methotrexate, uh, which we still use today. Uh, in fact, we even use it in, in breast cancer. So, so chemotherapy, what, what is chemotherapy? Well, simply put, chemotherapy is a drug that takes advantage of the fact that cancer cells divide more rapidly than normal cells. The problem, of course, is that there are normal cells that also divide rapidly, particularly the gut lining, the hair follicle, and the bone marrow. So chemotherapy does come with a host of side effects as many of you on this uh, call have likely experienced. Uh, that, that photo is, is the cell cycle, and most chemotherapy that we have today works on this cycle. And nowhere is the, the side effects of chemotherapy underscored more than this famous terrible case of, uh, 
a Boston Globe reporter, uh, mother of two, Betsy Lehman, uh, who in 1994 was undergoing treatment for metastatic breast cancer. And she was put on a clinical trial. And this is at the famed Dana-Farber Cancer Center, uh, named for Sidney Farber. And unfortunately, due to an error that no one picked up, residents, fellows, attendings, pharmacists, nurses, um, she received a, a lethal dose of the drug cytoxin, which is a drug we use in breast cancer um, every day. And unfortunately, um, she did pass uh, in the hospital, um, which led to a complete change in how we look at chemotherapy and, and really helped spur the movement into what where we are today, which is really in the targeted um, you know, uh, biologic type therapies that, that I'll be talking about. So that is my segue into today. So this is really the moment where we realized that targeted therapy can actually work. So this drug, which most breast cancer patients, patients have never heard of, uh, Gleevec, is what I call the penicillin of oncology. Uh, about 20, 21 years ago, there was a trial with this drug. It's used in a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia. And this trial was, uh, was the most effective phase one clinical trial ever, uh, where almost 100% of patients achieved a complete remission, and usually within a month. And so this drug immediately was approved by the FDA and really helped usher in uh, this age of targeted therapy. So what is targeted therapy, biologic therapy? Um, so this, this is the sort of treatment that doesn't really focus too much on how, how rapidly cells grow, but focuses on the difference and tries to exploit that difference between the cancer cell and the normal cell. And the two main types of treatments, and there are many, but the two main types that we see uh, today are monoclonal antibodies, which the, uh, will end in the three letters MAB, um, and then small molecule, what we call tyrosine kinase inhibitors. They end in, uh, it's actually NIB. Um, we have both of these types of drugs in breast cancer, as we'll, we'll talk about. So this crazy looking slide is just a part of the various targets that we're looking at in various cancers. And in fact, just a quick perusal of this, um, there's at least a dozen, if not more, targets just on this one um, uh, pathway sheet that uh, we're targeting in breast cancer today. And many drugs that already are approved that, uh, that target here. This, by the way, is a Tokyo subway station, eerily identical. Um, so the first target, and the one that even today is likely the most successful in breast cancer, is known as HER2 nu. So HER2 nu is it's a receptor, which means it's on the surface. Part of it uh, sticks out of the surface of the cancer cell. Part of it is on the inside of the cancer cell, as you can see in this in this photo. And the way HER2 works is it has to attach to itself or to any of the other HER receptors. So it's a process called dimerization. And when that happens, bad things happen from a cancer standpoint. More cells grow, divide, spread, et cetera. Measuring HER2 has been a, a complicated task over these last 20 years. We are really looking for one thing we're looking to see if there's more. HER2 than there needs to be. And so there's a couple of ways that we measure it. Many of you have seen on your pathology reports, um, these numbers 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, that's uh, where we're measuring the protein. It's called IHC, immunohistochemistry. The other way is uh, looking at the gene, which is with a uh, technology called FISH, fluorescence in situ hybridization. We often do at least one of these and often both of them. And this is uh, an example of the current FDA-approved therapies in HER2-new positive metastatic breast cancer. So you can see here that 
um, you know, these last few years ha have seen uh, significant uh, changes with uh, several new drugs that are approved. Um, when I started practice, Herceptin was the only drug. So it's, uh, it's, it has been quite exciting to see the, uh, the advances. And just as an aside, um, that last drug on the list uh, just a week or two ago uh, presented uh, some evidence uh, from one of its trials at the European uh, Cancer Conference, uh, which uh, showed dramatic improvements uh, versus some of the other therapies. So again, we are seeing constant changes uh, in, in the management of HER2 new positive metastatic breast cancer. One of those changes, and just to pull back one here, a couple of these drugs, Cadcyla and NHER2, are what we call antibody drug conjugates. So this is another advance in, in not just in breast cancer, in all cancers, but in metastatic breast cancer, this is a particularly interesting uh, type of treatment. So these ADCs, as they're called, the idea behind ADCs is that you have an antibody. So in the case of uh, Cadcyla and HER2, the antibody is Herceptin. The antibody has to have a high attraction for its target, and there has to be a lot of that target. But the, the difference in these drugs is that the antibody actually acts like a chauffeur for the cytotoxic drug. So the antibody is attached to a chemo drug. But instead of the chemo going all over the body and causing all its problems, the chemo gets driven directly to where the cancer is. And so if you have these criteria, the high affinity antibody, stable linker, the ratio has to be right, and the ability to release the payload at the target, you get very effective therapies like Ketzyla and HER2. And, and ADCs are actually used in other cancers now as well. Um, this is a, a term that I think everyone has heard of in, in cancer, um, immunotherapy. So immunotherapy means a lot, a, a lot of different things, but there's essentially two types of immunotherapy that we look at in, in breast cancer. Um, the first one has an FDA approval already, and that those are known as checkpoint inhibitors. So we may have heard of the drug Keytruda or Tacentric. Uh, Tacentric recently was voluntarily um, uh, recalled by the company for breast cancer, not because of any side effects or toxicity, but uh, to relook at some of the data on the effectiveness of it. But uh, Keytruda is still approved uh, currently in triple negative breast cancer. But the idea behind these checkpoint inhibitors, as this um, cartoon shows, is that you, we have T cells. The T cells are what I call the pit bulls of the immune system. Certain cancers have the ability to blindfold the T cells. And so as the, as the cancer cells are floating in through the blood, they are able to literally shut off the T cell via this, this pathway known as PDL1. So the, the cancer cell shuts it off and then the T cell doesn't attack the cancer. So with these inhibitors, PDL1 inhibitors like Keytruda, we can break this interaction and ostensibly wake the cell, wake the T cells back up to then fight the cancer. So immunotherapy is different than all the other treatments in that we're not fighting the cancer directly with the drug, but we're actually allowing a patient's immune system to optimally fight the cancer itself. Um, this other type of therapy is not yet FDA approved in breast cancer, but is certainly very exciting in all cancer, and that's called CAR T-cell therapy. So CAR T-cell therapy, the best analogy is this, the bomb-sniffing dog. So again, T-cells, we teach the T cells to recognize something about the cancer that's unique. And we do that through a complex process involving uh, viral vectors and some changes in, in, the, in the, the genetic code of the, of the T cell. And then we inject the T cells back into the patient. And now the, the T cells know exactly where to go and what to fight. So this um, is on the horizon. It's not, uh, not immediately ready for prime time, but possibly in a, in a few years. Um, I, I wanna mention triple negative breast cancer because um, this is its own unique subtype. About 20% of patients with metastatic breast cancer have triple negative. Triple negative essentially means that 
um, there's none of those three receptors, the estrogen, the progesterone, or the HER2. And um, because of that, there also is little in the way of the target. So we can't exploit the estrogen pathways. We can't exploit HER2. Um, however, progress has been made in triple negative breast cancer as well. Uh, the drug Keytruda, as I was saying, uh, showed some significant benefits. There's another drug called Trodelvi, which was just approved about a year ago, uh, and again, some others on the horizon. Um, that. So, um, and then estrogen positive. Uh, the majority of patients with metastatic breast cancer actually have estrogen positive breast cancer. What that means is that those cancers, at least partly, are driven by estrogen. So trying to combat estrogen in various ways becomes important. So we obviously have these anti-estrogen therapies. Um, tamoxifen is still uh, something that we use in, in metastatic breast cancer. That's known as a SERM, selective estrogen receptor modulator. There are the aromatase inhibitors, which many patients are on, letrozole, um, anastrozole, et cetera. And then there's drugs like Fazlodex, which are known as uh, receptor down regulators. And uh, advances are being made in all of these, including an oral CERD, which is um, we are actually uh, studying right now at MD Anderson. No, we have a clinical trial. Um, these um, these CDK four six inhibitors. Uh, many of our patients with metastatic breast cancer are on these. Um, Ibrant, Verzenio, Kiskali. Um, the idea behind these, uh, if we uh, remembered that that pathway sheet it essentially goes after one of the proteins or a couple of the proteins involved in that cell cycle. So as the, as the cancer cell is figuring out ways to bypass the estrogen dam that we put up there, um, the CDK4 and 6 seem to be ways that, that the cancer figures it out. And so we block those pathways. And so uh, these drugs have become a staple in the management of uh, metastatic breast cancer uh, over the last few years. And then there are others. There's um, a drug called Affinitor, a new drug called Picray, which has been out about a year. Um, some of them, many of them, require what's known as genomic testing. So I want to make sure I mention this. Um, I'd say the biggest change in the last five to 10 years in, in metastatic breast cancer is this. So our ability to detect mutations not just not just in the in the person, which is known as a germline mutation. Those are uh, what we look for when we are worried about hereditary cancer, so that uh, cancer that could have come down through generations. But actually, mutations in the genes of the cancer itself. Those are known as somatic mutations. So our ability to detect all of this ha has progressed significantly over the last five years. Ooh. But somatic mutations are where we uh, uh, where we look at our targeted therapies. Um, genomic testing is also another word for precision medicine, individualized medicine, tailored medicine, et cetera. Um, we now can do genomic testing, not just on the tissue, so not just on a biopsy, but we can actually do a blood test now for many patients with metastatic breast cancer and identify and isolate what are known as circulating tumor cells or in some cases, even pieces of DNA that are circulating in the blood, uh, extract those and then uh, do a, genetic, a genomic analysis. Uh, so at this point, I would say every single patient that I see with metastatic breast cancer at some point in their course of treatment will be getting uh, a genomic test. Uh, and just to give an example of how powerful this is, this is an actual patient of mine um, from about a year or so ago, a young woman, with ER positive, estrogen positive, HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer at the time. Uh, she'd actually had it for five years, it's a three, but um, we noted that there were some changes in her liver. And so um, we did a liver biopsy, but weren't able to get enough tissue for the testing. So we did a blood test. And this is actually her genomic test, which looks like a bunch of letters and numbers, but these are, all of these became relevant because that first mutation told us that we can use um, the assert Fazlodex. We couldn't use the, the oral therapies. That second mutation told us that we could use this drug. This mutation, the BRAF 
mutation made her eligible for an international, uh, sorry, a national uh, clinical trial through the NCI. And this last one was quite relevant because she had genetic testing done years ago, but because of this, we expanded her genetic testing and found out that she actually has a hereditary cancer syndrome. Um, and two of her siblings were tested and found to be positive and have been making steps to try to reduce their risk. So we put her on therapy based off of this. And as of today, she is doing well. Um, uh, of course, uh, any mention of genetics is not complete without, under, without mentioning the BRCA gene, the BRCA gene. Um, can be mutated, and it makes the cancer cell uh, ineffective in repairing errors. But when that happens, it predisposes to breast and ovarian cancer, among other cancers. Um, because of the mutation, cancer cells that, that have it, they, they rely heavily on this one enzyme called PARP, P-A-R-P. And we now have PARP inhibitors. So PARP inhibitors are clearly effective in, um, in these patients. So, and not just in breast cancer. So we see these mutations in other cancers um, and there is efficacy there as well. At this point, every single patient with metastatic breast cancer should at least get testing for BRCA1 and 2. And as I said, um, many will get genomic testing as well. Um, we have uh, at MD Anderson Cooper, what's known as a molecular tumor board. We meet at this point, I believe it's every other month where this is, this is a different concept than most of our tumor boards, uh, which are specific to different diseases, breast cancer, lung cancer. These are not specific to the disease. We Here we present cases uh, based solely on the genomic testing. So we have um, genomics uh, physicians on, on the phone. Uh, we have our team of various disciplines and we discuss cases and, and therapies that would make sense that we otherwise wouldn't think of. Um, so, so does all of this actually work? Does genomics help? So it turns out clearly it does. This is just one of many studies, but European study looking at almost uh, 1,200 patients, over 40 cancer types, that found that there was a 32% increase in survival when treating patients based off these matched um, approaches. So in other words, finding a mutation and treating off the mutation versus just doing it um, the way we used to do it, which is um, you know, looking at a plate of options and then picking one. So clearly the paradigm is changing. Um, in the next five to 10 years, I, I think all of us expect that we'll, we will not be looking at cancer so much by where they start and what stage they are, or rather by the genomic fingerprints. Um, even the staging system, which is known as the TNM system, may become more obsolete uh, in another decade or so. And we are looking at multiple ways to enhance immune function, proteomics, um, and uh, we are all hoping that cytotoxic chemo drugs like methotrexate, alkylating agents, and some of the, uh, the treatments that were given 50, 60 years ago will go by the wayside. So thank you, and I uh, will be taking questions after uh, Dr. Alawat's presentation. Thanks, Dr. Meda. that was great. So Dr. Meda did a great job of setting me up a little bit, and he talked a lot about the systemic options or things that could treat the entire body, and um, as Roxanne mentioned earlier, my name is Cynthia Alawat, and I will be reviewing what new treatment options there are in metastatic breast cancer as a radiation oncologist and part of the radiation team. Um, so, but first, you know, sometimes it's nice to start off with what our whole point is. Radiation does play a significant role um, in the treatment of patients with metastatic breast cancer. Not only can we help with local control, meaning treating the area that's giving us an issue versus palliation, such as pain relief, or if there's numbness tingling somewhere, radiation can help with that. Um, I think one of the areas that's been of biggest advance in radiation are these techniques of ablative radiation called SBRT, or you know, we're trying to get fancy, we call it SABR also. Um, basically, they stand for stereotactic body radiation or stereotactic ablative radiation. They have extremely high rates of control, <coughs> excuse me, but they must be done carefully with someone that is informed in how to use these techniques and have 
um, machines that can enable that. You know, there's lots of brand names out there, just like if you get a Samsung or, you know, an LG TV, there's also TrueBeams and CyberKnife and something called an MRI Linac, which I'll touch more on. Um, but ablative radiation is a great way for us to delay switching something that Dr. Meta is giving you. You know, maybe if there's one area that's growing or giving an issue, we can work on that area while keeping you on treatment that's working everywhere else in the body. Um, and so it can also potentially improve survival. We need to look more into this, but it's a very exciting field for us and in oncology. So let's go over a few terms that you might hear thrown around in a radiation oncology clinic, which we don't expect you to know, but fraction is, or a fraction are the number of treatments that we get. Gray is a unit of absorbed radiation. So when we talk about ablative radiation, we say 50 gray in five fractions. Or some of you, if you've had radiation, you received 50 gray in 25 fractions. Um, we've talked about SBRT for a second, it's stereotactic body radiotherapy. And then SABER, our, again, our fancy term, um, is stereotactic ablative radiotherapy. Metastasis means that the cancer has left the area where it started. So for our purposes, if it started in the breast, it's now spread outside of that primary area. A linear accelerator or a LINAC is a common radiation machine. We have two brand names here, MD Anderson Cooper. And then the third type of machine that we have is an MR LINAC. Some people got a Mr. LINAC. Um, but it is an, a radiation machine that specifically uses MRI rather than CT or X-ray based um, image guidance. So, you know, this slide kind of helps us see the progression of where radiation is come 2D was the era when we only had x-rays available to us. Um, and that was really the case for a long time. Then 3D came about when we were using more CAT scan or CT-based um, uh, radiation planning. And now we're in the era of SBRT, 4D, meaning we can even watch the motion of how something is moving, particle therapy. So in the era of 2D, if there was a tumor and we were trying to get to the tumor, there was a lot of normal tissue that we were hitting. In 3D, when we had CT-based, we were able to shrink that normal tissue down even more. Now, with SBRT and more respiratory management or some of the fancier tools that we get with MRI, we can treat the tumor and minimize the amount of normal tissue that we're going after. So again, it kind of through the theme of what Dr. Meadow was mentioning, you know, we're trying to target this the best that we can. We're trying to refine what we can do in our treatment. Um, so there's also this concept of oligometastatic disease. So not only have, has this um, cancer moved out of the primary site, but it's moved to just a few places. So oligo means a few. It's thought to be usually less than five areas. Um, there's some controversy. Some say it can go up to 10, some say three, but for our purposes, let's say five. Um, and what happens is there's a few cells that managed to escape the area. They changed and mutated. They didn't get controlled the way we wanted them to. They deposited in other areas and, and grown there. And so, you know, what can we do? We, we listened to what Dr. Meta said, there's targeted ways for us to treat that, whether that's chemo or systemic therapy, immunotherapy. Um, we could take them out. Sometimes it's one or two places and we've got great surgical oncologists that can help us cut it out. And then the other option for local therapy, and now this is taking it out with surgery, is radiation. And so when we go down this pathway though, we have to define what it is that we want to accomplish. Are we trying to treat all those areas? Is there an area that's bothering us that we want to treat? Um, is there an area that um, is growing but it's not bothering us and we want to kind of go for a different type of approach of trying to quote unquote cure because everything else is quiet? Um, and so I think as a patient and, a, and with your physician, we have to think about where, what's our goal here? Um, is our intent to ablate, which means eradicate it, palliate, just get rid of the pain or change the way the disease is? So we're going to kind of look at the ablating portion of this um, treatment paradigm. And what, what is ablative or stereotactic radiation? So it's very high dose radiation down to the millimeter precision that is um, targeted to anywhere in the body. But the emphasis is on the high dose because it's, you know, if, like I mentioned, if any of you have radiation before, sometimes that was a course of four to five to six weeks where this is over the course of five treatments given over the week, a week or a week and a half. And we can go, to treat any area of the body, including the brain, the lung, the spine, lymph nodes, et cetera. Um, generally via LINAC or a linear accelerator, but there are other fancier machines. 
Um, you have to, again, be <coughs> excuse me, in a specialized um, clinic that's able to do this safely and expertly, um, as well as uh, can offer you the proper immobilization, meaning they're able to isolate the area we want to treat properly. Um, and the benefit is that we have extremely high rates of control. The area that we treat is um, generally controlled up to 90% of the time. So this is the Marlin Act that we touched on briefly, and since we're trying to talk about the new advances, this is a machine that we have in Mount Laurel, um, which is a linear accelerator like all of our other machines, but very specifically in the back in here, there's an MRI. And so this is where the patient would be lying down. You guys can see my mouse, right? Um, this is where the patient would be lying down, and then you get um, loaded into the machine for the treatment. And we have active guidance with an MR that helps us find the tumor. So like I mentioned, it uses MRI guidance to help us deliver it. That can also help us find many different structures better than we would with a regular X-ray or a CAT scan. So to give you an example of that, um, these are various images of a CAT scan of an abdomen. So on, on the right-hand side, we can see the liver, but you don't really, don't really see much there. And now you can see that there's this area of abnormality in the liver that we can watch with, this is without contrast and with contrast, that we can watch on the MR and to deliver radiation much more specifically when we can see it better. We can also adapt the anatomy better when we can see it better. Again, another um, example, this is a brain. So, you know, you can kind of maybe see something vague, dark back here on this CAT scan, but on the MRI, we can see exactly where the tumor was and where we want to treat. So I'm going to give you some examples of um, some sample plans that of patients that we've treated. There's no uh, way to identify anything. Um, if you recognize anyone, please don't say anything, but I don't imagine that you will. This is a CAT scan, or I'm sorry, an MRI image of a chest. So out here we have a breast. This over here is a patient that has a large tumor right above the heart. And so what we were able to do is treat this patient, use the MRI technology, carve out the area that we want to treat and save all the normal lung on each side, the heart, the other breast, um, stay away from the spinal cord. It just helps us visualize what we're doing much better. Again, another example, um, and this is of the abdomen. So this is the front of the body, the back of the body, um, the right, the left. And this is a slice of an individual. And so the tumor is right over here, and we're very tightly able to stay around the tumor and avoid all the normal structures. In the days of 2D imaging, this probably would have been one, you know, going through and through from the front to the back and maybe something from the side. And, and you can imagine that then doesn't save the normal liver and the normal other structures that we have in the area. And this illustration of how we can treat if there's something going on in the spine but still save all of the other organs that are in the area. And again, I'm sure we can recognize these are the two eyes. So this is a patient of mine with breast cancer that had um, a metastasis right here in the bone right by the right eye. And so we were able to treat this area while staying away from the rest of the brain, staying away from the eyes, staying away from some of the other structures of the same side of the eye. So. You know, that's fancy and those are really pretty pictures, but does it actually make a difference uh, for you as a patient? And what randomized trials, meaning that's some of our best evidence, that's when we say a patient gets this treatment versus not, and then we compare them at the end. What they've shown is that when we use ablative radiation, we can increase um, the patient's survival and progression-free survival, meaning it changes um, how fast the tumor is uh, growing. And so, you know, I think it's a very exciting area. There, there's options for when we have limited disease that we use something like this in conjunction with what Dr. Mehta talked about. Um, so just to kind of summarize everything for us, radiation plays a very big role in metastatic disease, especially metastatic breast cancer. Like we said, we can control it locally to make sure it doesn't grow. And we can also make sure that we're treating any kind of symptoms that we're having, such as pain or, um, numbness, tingling. Ablative radiation has very high rates of control. This is the forefront of where radiation is going. You know, this is how we're going to work well with our
medical oncology colleagues to keep things under bay um, and at control. And ablative radiation helps us to delay switching from something that's working for you. If there's only one area that isn't um, uh, responding quite as well, then we can use the radiation to treat that area, but still try to hold on to some of the systemic stuff that is working everywhere else. 